actually don't like the term digital transformation, right? Because it implies an event, right? It's like everybody works hard and you know you do this for 18 months and then you're done. I think the reality is this is what many executives, maybe even most executives are going to be doing the rest of their career, right? This is the new way of doing business. And we're still in the very, very early innings of it in terms of its real impact and how it's going to change what business leaders do. If we were having this conversation 10 years from now, we wouldn't be talking about business leaders and technology leaders. Every business leader is going to need to also be a technology leader. Those things are going to be fully integrated. And I think that's the, that's the journey we're on rather than a one-time transformation. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. It's great to have Rodney join me here on the Walker webcast. Um, I'm going to, uh, first of all, I have to say I had your colleague, Carolyn DeWar on talking about CEO excellence last year, Rodney, and it was a real pleasure having Carolyn on uh, to discuss that book, which a number of your client, your colleagues wrote. Um, I'm deeply thankful to our mutual friend, Gary Pincus, for putting the two of us uh, in touch with one another. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to diving into our discussion. Um, a couple things before um, I, I jump in. Uh, the first is that um, next week's Walker webcast is with Jeffrey Wright, uh, who beyond being one of my childhood friends, uh, has just been nominated for the Academy Award for his role in American fiction. And Jeff and I recorded the Walker webcast last week. And I would just say to anyone listening today, if you want to hear a really engaging conversation on everything from families to race to uh, how to become uh, one of the leading actors in Hollywood uh, the com and also playing college lacrosse, which we both did. And we played lacrosse together in grade school as well as in high school. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a great discussion and we'll have that out next week. Um, the other thing, Rodney, is I'm going to New York next week, and I'm um, actually uh, interviewing Gloria Steinem, who will be on the Walker webcast yeah. the following week. And you have a quote in your book from Gloria, which, as you can imagine, I'm reading your book, and all of a sudden there's a quote from Gloria Steinem, which A, I didn't expect, and B, is a great quote, which we'll talk about in, in, in just a moment. Um, let me dive in here with an intro, Rodney, and then we'll go. Rodney um, Zemel is global leader of McKinsey Digital serving clients across a range of industries on growth strategies, performance improvement, and value creation by harnessing the power of data and analytics, digital culture and capabilities, modernized core technologies, and digital business building. McKinsey Digital now represents more than half of the firm's client work, with more than 7,000 colleagues across 100 offices specialized in digital and analytics. Rodney previously led McKinsey's healthcare practice, working with clients in pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, and healthcare services. He also led the firm's support for private equity clients and other companies in consumer-facing industries. Rodney is recognized as a thought leader, writing articles that appear in leading business and technical publications, including the Harvard Business Review and Nature Reviews. He is a co-author of the books, Go Long, Why Long-Term Thinking is Your Best Short-Term Strategy, and Rewired, the McKinsey Guide to Outcompeting in the Age of Digital and AI. Rodney is a graduate of Cambridge University, where he earned a PhD in molecular biology. So Rodney, I got to start with this. How does a doctor in molecular biology end up running digital transformation at McKinsey? Well, it's all DNA, right? So in the old days, it was DNA and in, in molecules, and now it's DNA for digital and analytics, but it's the, it's the same stuff. But th the first time I ever used the internet was actually when I was a, uh, a scientist in the, I should say the early 90s. I was working on, uh, on HIV uh, in, uh, in Cambridge. And the first time I ever accessed the internet was to compare different, uh, different gene sequences. And, uh, you know, back then I had no idea that it was going to come to define sort of this chapter of my professional career at McKinsey. But I think those tools that started out in the scientific realm and, you know, it took a long time. It took 20 years plus. And then now it's just got absolutely transformational implications for business. It's just really exciting. But the honest answer is when I joined McKinsey, I said I was going to stay for two years and then go get a real job. So I think I have failed on the getting a real job part. Um, we, we, we always said that the, uh, 
the, the Baker scholars at Harvard Business School all went on to be McKinsey consultants because they were too smart to do anything else. <laughs> um, so before we dive into your book, which is so good, and I, there's like, as I was getting ready for this, Rodney, there's like one line after another line after another line that I, and, and I'm, we'll put a bunch of this into our show notes so that people can see some of these things that I picked out. Um, but there's so many really important sort of frameworks that you and your colleagues put into the book. But before we dive into that, I want to talk for a moment. It seems like everyone today is jumping to just the benefits of digital transformation and AI. And we seem to have forgotten about the downside. There are a lot of people who have sort of forgotten about the fact that we are creating a, a technology that could be weaponized against us. And I had Mo Gadot, who used to run Google X on the Walker webcast, I think it was now two years ago, talking about his book, Scary Smart. Um, I know half of McKinsey's work is on digital transformation, and you are truly one of the world's great experts on AI. How much does that downside concern you, Rodney, and how many clients are talking to you about not only the good side and how it can benefit their 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 business, but the downside of what this could actually unleash. So listen, the downsides are very real, right? But I would I pass them a little bit, right? The first downside is actually just wasting money, right? I mean, most business executives have been promised amazing things through technology for the past 20 years plus. And one of the reasons we wrote the book is we actually think about 70% of digital transformations are actually not hitting their financial objectives. So the first risk, right, which, you know, sounds prosaic, but right, is meaningful, is just the risk of wasting your money and wasting your effort. That's one whole category of risk. I think you were asking me more, though, about sort of the, uh, the more, um, uh, you know, societal risks and maybe even the existential risks, right, of do we create these all-powerful machines that will, you know, will end up sort of taking over humanity and so on. I think there's a few different categories in there. So there's a set of risks that really are features of the new technology. Like people would get talk a lot about hallucinations and how AI can make things up and so on. That's true. It's designed that way, right? You can create versions of AI that hallucinate less and just sort of stick to the facts more. Those turn out to be less engaging and people enjoy interacting with them less. So you have a choice as to how creative to make something or how straight down the line to make something. And obviously, when you're making something creative, there's more a chance that it strays into fiction rather than fact. But that's a choice that's within a company's power and a choice you can control by how many technical layers you put on top of that and ultimately having humans in the loop checking it. That's that's sort of one thing. Another thing then is, you know, how AI can introduce bias, right? And AI is trained on human data. All human data sets contain bias, right? Whether that's a deliberate bias or accidental bias. And in particular, anything that's been trained on all the crazy things that have been written on the internet are bound to have all kinds of uh, biases in it. Again, that's a that, that that's something that can be designed around, right? And one of the, the 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 great things about AI is you can actually measure what's coming out and do A/B testing, and you can actually track the bias in a way that's been much harder in any other technologies. So I actually think it lets you shine a spotlight on bias and will let you address it, right, if it's used well. The two areas where I think there's the biggest areas of risk, which are related, one is, of course, around deep fake, right? And around, you know, we, we may never know what's real again, right? And how easy it's going to be to create fake content, plagiarized content, offensive content, all of those things. There's many technical approaches to try to watermark and try to help people tell the difference between what's artificial and what's real. That's going to be tough. I'm actually not hugely optimistic that we are going to be able to easily tell what's AI-generated content versus what's real content. And we might go back to an era where we actually care a lot about the source and about trusted sources rather than just taking what we see on face value. That's one category of risk. Another category of risk is the whole area of persuasion, right? These are amazingly powerful persuasion technologies. Maybe we'll talk about that a bit more when we get into some examples. And of course, you can persuade people for good or persuade people for business purposes, but you can persuade people for bad as well. And that's an area which I think has got, which, which I think could be uh, quite challenging for society. And I think it's healthy that business and, uh, uh, and, and regulators are beginning to pay real attention to that area. Start a legacy. Start turning dreams into realities. A better world begins with you. Better communities start with us. One quick aside before I ask you the next question. When I was reading the book, 
there was a we were talking about people in photographs and uh, creating needing access to their own photo libraries. It actually made me think that maybe Getty Images actually is worth a whole lot more than people thought because people want to be able to actually own content rather than going out and having to constantly um, uh, pay licensing fees for it. But anyway, that's a that, that's a whole different tangent. But it was interesting as you were talking about some companies that are creating their own photo databases so they don't have to continue to tap back to someone like Getty Images um, for a moment. Ronnie, just explain the difference between AI, machine learning, and deep learning uh, to the people who are listening in, because I, I think people hear either AI or machine learning or deep learning, and they don't quite understand the difference between them. And I jumped right to AI, and you gave a great answer on the potential concerns there. But just frame that for listeners, if you would. Yeah, and to be honest, they're all different flavors of the same ice cream, right? So it's the, 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 for, for an average person, the, the distinctions are not are not hugely meaningful. I mean, the two categories I would put it in is until sort of December of uh, 2022, most of what we were talking about was in the broad category of artificial intelligence, of AI. And what AI means is basically a system that gets better when you give it more data, right? So, you know, an automatic gearbox in a car was an amazing improvement over a manual gearbox, but you sort of do that once. It doesn't get any better the more you use it, right? The advantage of AI is it learns from how it's being used and it gets better over time, right? That in essence is AI, you know, deep learning, machine learning, and so on, are different flavors of how you do that. The big leap that happened in early, late 22, early 23 with the large language models is the move from sort of regular AI to generative AI. Generative AI is what, you know, chat GPT and all these sort of language models can, 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 can create. And in sort of business terms, the relevance is in the past, with the other forms of AI, for everything you were doing, you needed to build a new model. So if you want to look at customer churn, that's a model. You want to look at supply chain, that's a model. You want to look at pricing, that's a model. What the new generative AI approaches do is basically it's like a Swiss army knife for AI. It's one model, one foundation model, that not with no tweaking, but with fairly minimal tweaking, you can apply against all kinds of different purposes, like a whole range of different things. So what it does is it massively lowers the cost to deploy AI and it massively democratizes it so many more people can use it. So that's the sort of the big, the big revolution. But even there, two years from now, three years from now, I'm not sure we're going to be talking about generative AI because there'll be some other flavor of AI and these things will all sort of work together in a way that the average user probably doesn't even need to understand the differences between them. So as we do- jump into your book, just a couple of things on Rewired before I, I start throwing some some uh, some questions to you. Number three on the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations! Um, and um, when you all started writing it, ninety percent of companies had a digital plan, but only about twenty percent were actually creating value by it. And so, you also state that your book is not a coffee table book; it's a real roll up your sleeves book. I will tell you, trying to listen to your book on a on a on an audio tape is very challenging. You need to to anyone on this on this uh, webcast listening in. You actually need to have the physical book because there's so many charts and 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 diagrams inside of it to to follow along what the team is telling you to think about doing. Uh, it's very helpful to see the actual physical book. Um, but one of the other things that as I approach the book, Rodney, that I think is so important for people to keep in mind is that you state it's still day one. In other words, I think a lot of people look at digital transformation and they think about AI and they say, oh my God, they're like we don't even know where to start. And A, your book is an incredible manual for how to start. But then second of all, you reiterate the fact that don't think that the train has left the station and is already, you know, halfway to Liverpool, if you're living in London where you do, um, that it's actually still in the station you can hop on. Yeah. So but I live in New York these days. and I Oh, you live in New York. Okay. Anyway. Oh, no, London, Liverpool is a better example than New York, Philadelphia, but same, <laughs> same, same deal. It's all good. Actually, I'm going to correct you. You're going to think I'm being petty. I'm going to correct you on one other thing as well. So we were actually number three on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. Oh, so. Um, um, and, uh, but no, no, no. But, but here's what I'm pointing out. So the New York Times apparently didn't include us in their rankings because they said the book is a manual and they don't review manuals. So I actually took that as a compliment because we did actually set out to write something that truly is going to be used like a manual, right? As you say, it's not the easiest audio book, right? It's so it, it, it might be that they have an AI algorithm that doesn't get that right. It's sort of like um, in, in, in one of the interviews that you did, Rodney, you, you, you talked about hallucinations. 
And where if you ask AI, who's Tom Cruise's mother, it will tell you the name of Tom Cruise's mother instantaneously. If you then go and say, who is the son of whatever Tom Cruise's mom's name is, it won't tell you. Um, And so it's just interesting about how these models are created and where they actually go. That, that, that's, that's exactly right. The newer versions may have fixed that, but that's a, that's a, it was an interesting quirk from, from earlier last year. But, so that's, but back on your day one point, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, I actually don't like the term digital transformation, right? Because it implies an event, right? It's like everybody works hard and you, know, you do this for 18 months and then you're done. I think the reality is this is what many executives, maybe even most executives are going to be doing the rest of their career, right? This is the new way of doing business. And we're still in the very, very early innings of it in terms of its real impact and how it's going to change what business leaders do. I actually think if we were having this conversation 10 years from now, we wouldn't be talking about business leaders and technology leaders. Every business leader is going to need to also be a technology leader. Those things are going to be fully integrated. And I think that's the, that's the journey we're on rather than a one-time transformation. I think that's one of the most fascinating pieces of the book while you dive deep on technology, on all of your rankings as it relates to what really needs to be done on, on any of the lists you look at, technology and data are well down. This is a this is a talent and process reorganization inside of corporations that needs executive leadership, which as CEO of a pretty scale company is a real eye-opener in the sense that we spend a lot of money on technology, but I thought it all kind of started from technology. It reminds me, Rodney, of a of a there's a Instagram uh, piece that's running around of Steve Jobs being grilled. And I think it was 2004, 2005 by somebody at one of the Apple conferences where this guy gets up and says to him, you know, first of all, what have you been doing for the past couple of years? And, and, and second of all, like you guys aren't creating any good code and, and, and Steve stops. And instead of responding poorly to the gentleman and telling him, you know, I'm on the stage and you're in the audience and there's a reason for that. He sat there and he said, you know, We could go and create a lot of great technology, but if we don't look at the customer and what the customer needs are, all that sort of technology-oriented work is only technology for technology's sake. And unless you look at what the customer needs and creating great products for the customer, all the technology is sort of worthless. And I I mean, it's quite something is the greatest developer and designer of technology in in our lifetime that he would actually you know, say that. And then your book is very much reiterating that it all comes from the top and that creating this digital roadmap is sort of step one for any company. Why don't you dive into that? Yeah, I think very, very, very well put, right? So look, it's not, not about technology, but it doesn't start with technology and it certainly doesn't end with technology. And what we saw as we looked at, so we, you know, the research that went into the book is we looked at about um, you know, our math is pretty much every large company on the planet now has something called a digital or AI transformation. Only about 30% of those hit their revenue targets, about 25% hit their cost targets. So the most are not hitting their financial goals. We took about 200 companies that were hitting those financial goals and tried to sort of reverse engineer what the recipe is, right? And that's what you're referring to. And technology is in that recipe but it's 0.4 in that recipe. It's not 0.1 in that recipe. And that, that's for a reason. And we actually saw as many companies that overspent on technology um, as we did that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that underspent. And companies that said, look, first, we're going to go build the amazing, perfect data lake and get everything you know, all super well structured. And then you know, we'll figure out all the amazing things we can do with it down the road. That can work. But that is a slow and expensive way to get to impact rather than starting with a business problem and working back. So I think that, you know, the Steve Jobs or the Steve Jobs era insight was it's about the customer. You've got to actually think about how you design a process around a customer, work back from that, make the technology serve that end. That's correct. What we're trying to do in the book, though, is go one further and say, actually, it's about the business impact overall. And the most important thing that any company leadership team or organization leadership team needs if they're trying to drive a a digital transformation is to start with a prioritized roadmap of where the value really is. So take any company, break it up into 10 or 20 domains. Those can be business units, functions, whatever you want, but like 10 or 20 pieces. Which one or two pieces are going to be the ones that are going to drive the most value if you can really transform and reimagine them with technology? Start there assign a real business value to that. And I'll come back to you know what, 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 what some of the metrics are for that in a moment. But assign a real business value to that. And don't think about 
what's the individual technology use case, but think about how do you completely transform that domain. I mean, it's very interesting. If you look at sort of generative AI right now, all the companies that in 2023 said, let's prioritize some bottom-up use cases, you know, I'll go build a co-pilot, I'll go build a, you know, a, a, a whatever. They're still sort of in pilot phase. Instead, if you said, okay, I'm going to take customer service, I'm not just going to build a co-pilot, but I'm going to take how do I actually improve that by 50%? That's going to take a co-pilot. That's going to take a scheduling approach. That's going to take three or four other things. And how do we do those things together with a clear financial objective? They are the ones who end up actually driving real value from it. It was interesting in, in the book, you point out that those companies that put real financial metrics behind exactly the process you just talked about um, had much better outcomes. And that doesn't surprise me. And yet at the same time, yeah. I think many people look at tech initiatives and they say, hey, don't give me a timeline because it's going to take time. And then also don't, I can't quantify what the outcome is going to be. So kind of to some degree, don't hold my feet to the fire. But it was very clear that those companies that said, we're going to improve EBITDA by 15 to 20% in your study got much better outcomes. So that's exactly right, right? So first of all, if you don't set a financial goal, you're not going to hit a financial goal, right? You don't need to uh, to, to, to buy a book to, to learn that, right? But what the, the, the specific finding is exactly as you just said. If you set a goal of 15 to 20% EBITDA in an area, your chance of hitting at least 80% of that goal turned out to be way higher than if you set a goal of like 2 or 3% in that area. So that was a little odd when we first sort of found that. And we, you know, we think the reason is, you know, the prize needs to be big enough, right? This stuff is hard, right? It needs real cross-functional working. It needs sustained involvement from the CEO. It needs real resource commitments. It needs, you know, real talent upskilling or new talent. You're only going to do that if the prize is big enough. So companies that set that big prize, right? 15 to 20% EBITDA down the area that we're focusing on were much more likely to hit the prize than those who said, let's do something small first and then sort of grow, grow our way to success. And you're absolutely right that I think there was this sort of sense that, you know, digital is different. It's hard to measure. It's hard to manage in the same way. And there are certainly aspects of it that are different, but we actually think you can have the same rigor around it as you would around any cost or any sales simulation program. So you, you, you kind of, I want to dive into pods and all that and two to five, and we'll get into some more specifics in a second, but I've listened to you talk sort of at 30,000 feet, Rodney, about takers, shapers, and makers. And I thought that that framework was extremely good to give, if you're a CEO listening in today, sort of, are you going to be a taker? Are you going to be a shaper? Are you going to be a maker? Could you dive in and segment the market into that? Because particularly on the taker piece, I think a lot of people, there's, a, I, know, I know where you're going to go with the answer to this. And I think a lot of people miss that there's someone else who's going to do the taker for them. Yeah. So um, I'll illustrate it maybe with generative AI again, right? So like around this time last year, lots of people were launching their first pilots with generative AI. And a lot of companies said, well, we don't want to do anything that touches a customer because that's risky. Let's find some safer places to start. So as an example, people said, okay, let's go to HR. We'll use this to generate job descriptions. We'll use this to go scrape LinkedIn. Or maybe we'll do finance, right? We'll go generate summaries of financial reports and so on. And we end up, what we found was, look, that's fine. You can do that, right? It's not that hard. The reality is it's not a great use of most companies' innovation brain cells because there's a very effective software market that's going to do that for you, right? That's going to get built into Workday or SAP or, you know, whomever it is that you use. So anything in your company that is, you know, it's an essential function, but it's not actually driving differentiation, right? So an enabling function, you know, most companies, you know, like finance, like HR and so on. There we would say, look for off-the-shelf tools, right? Just go wait for the, you know, the vendors that cut across many industries. Just go wait for them to develop something and then go bring it in. Now, all the way at the other end of the spectrum, there are some companies who are going to go and build their own large language models, right? Who are really going to go and like create their own their very specialized applications. That's expensive. That's hard. That's going to be hard to maintain. We think there's going to be only a very small number of companies who are going to want to do that and for whom it's going to make economic sense. Maybe you've got very significant concerns around privacy or very special needs. For an average company, in areas that are competitively differentiating, you're going to want to be a shaper, right? So pick an area that really drives competitive advantage for you. So for most companies, that might be something around customer 
around supply chain or you know depending on what you do it could be could be anything but you know what part of your business is you know you think you're going to derive some competitive advantage from it and if all you're going to do in those areas is go and buy some industry solution you're only going to get industry average results so if it's going to be competitive advantage you actually need to make something that's more tailored for you but you don't need to make it from the ground up right you can make it from pre-existing components right that's where the shaper concept comes in so if it's not differentiating but you need it go be a taker. If it's going to drive differentiation, be a shaper. And in some rare cases for some companies, you may want to go all the way to being a maker. Um, you talk about two makers of being Bloomberg and Saudi, Saudi Aramco, who are both in the process of building their own um, uh, models and, and their own databases. Um, but I've heard you talk about the six large language models and the fact that they're really, they all are going back and deriving from the same Google data to start with. And therefore, don't get too caught up in picking whether you're going to work with ChatGPT or whether you're going to work with Google or any of the other ones out there, that they're all essentially the same. I, I thought that was super interesting, Rodney, but you then add to that what people ought to think about, about who they're going to choose to partner with as it relates to architecture. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah. So, I mean, the history of how these large language models came about is really fascinating, or maybe it's only fascinating to a nerd like me, but I, I find it fascinating. So like, if you look at like, there's, there's a several hundred year history of people trying to imitate human language with machines, right? And there were broadly two schools of thought, right? There was a structuralist school of thought that says there's hidden patterns in language. We've got to kind of, you know, figure out what the hidden patterns are, and then we can imitate them. And then there was a more probability or statistics oriented school that said, all you need to know is just understand the probability that one word will follow another word. And for like a hundred years, there's been this debate in linguistics about how does language really work? What these large language models showed was you can get a very long way with the probabilistic version, right? All you need to do is just, it's just a prediction machine for what word will come after the word before. But the breakthrough was the computing power that said, you're not just taking you know, word one and trying to predict word two, but you're predicting word two based on what was, you know, word minus three, minus four, you know, much further back in the sentence. And it was really only through the availability of massive computing power that we were able to do these giant sort of statistical correlations and come up with these prediction machines for what word was going to come next. Actually, it's a token, it's a fraction of a word, but same concept. And this was laid out in a paper from some Google DeepMind, DeepMind, DeepRain, Google researchers in 2017. Um, and they were trying to solve a translation problem, right? They were trying to show, you know, how do you actually predict word order between different languages? And I think at the time they published that paper, they thought they were doing just the service to language translation and like solving this like linguistics puzzle. And I don't think they quite realized at the time just how relevant this was going to be to predicting everything, right? Math, image, music, whatever, on the whole sort of revolution that we're now in. But because that piece of work was published and open sourced and so on, lots of other people have taken that and done very, very similar things. And what we see, actually, not just what we see, if you take an institute like um, the Stanford um, Artificial Intelligence, uh, Human Artificial Intelligence Institute, they benchmark these models. And what they see is all the models essentially perform incredibly similar. And then someone will come out with a new version, and then they'll pretty quickly, asymptotically, all sort of converge on that again. So we're seeing this sort of model, you know, arms race, but they're all actually pretty similar. I don't want to diminish that there are differences. You know, there really are you know, certain performance differences for certain applications, but there's a cluster of them that all behave similarly. So if it's not actually the prediction power that's different between the models, you're then left with a set of choices around, you know, different kinds of choices around which one you want to use. Some people are betting on open source and saying, I actually don't want to have, you know, one company black box. I'd rather have like the more open approach. Other people say open source is risky um, and will, you know, will never perform as well. Some people are saying, I want to use a model that, you know, exists in the cloud and I'll send my data into the cloud and so on, because that's going to be better performance and lower cost and so on. Other people are saying, actually, I'd rather keep my data where I have it. And therefore, I want a model that will run on my environment. So I think it's those sorts of architecture choices and ultimately cost choices as well that are going to drive choices, choice of model as much as, um, you know, which one can perform better. When you talk about that architecture, you sort of bury in the middle of the book a memo from uh, Jeff Bezos to everyone at 
Amazon as it relates to APIs. Will you dive into that for a second? Because I found that memo to be eye-opening and kind of mind-spinning as it relates to that seminal memo that he sent out to the team at Amazon. Yeah, no, so thanks for spotting that. And this is actually pretty, it's a, a pretty famous story in the history of Amazon and the history of technology. So, you know, one of the hard problems in any big organization is how do you get teams to work autonomously um, without drowning in all the interdependencies, right? And that's a problem in any kind of business problem. Like if anyone who's done a big integration or anyone who is, um, you know, like rolling out a big new org and change problem, right? How does the work of one team depend on the work of another team? Right. In technology, that problem is really acute because everybody's interacting with the same core systems. And, you know, how do you actually move ahead in a way that you don't create horrible dependencies for what everybody else wants to do to come after you? So the technical solution to that is called an API, right? An application program interface that just allows different pieces of technology to work with each other. And what, what Jeff famously did at Amazon, and I only know this not even secondhand, probably thirdhand, is there was a moment in time where they were worried that all these interdependencies were going to like slow the place down. So they put down a hard edit saying everything needs to have an API, right? Every team, your output that you are ultimately responsible for is an API to interact with all the other teams. And if it can't be turned into an API, don't do it because that's the only way we're going to scale. And that drove a big culture change that was hugely effective for them. And I think in many other industries that are maybe a little bit less tech intense, they're still sort of learning that lesson, but it's going to be you know, incredibly important how you build real scalability in what you're trying to do in technology. You state in the book that this roadmap and the transformation roadmap has to, A, start from the very top, that any CEO who thinks that he or she can delegate this to somebody else, whether it's the chief information officer or somebody else on their executive team is is, is missing the boat. Uh, you also talk about the 20 hours that are required for any member of the the team that is going out to try and come up with this digital roadmap needs to invest. And I literally talked about it yesterday with my executive team, Rodney, and it was it was fun because we sat there and someone was like, 20 hours isn't nearly enough. And someone else says, I don't have 20 hours. And right. you just, I think that 20 hour framework is extremely helpful because it does make people sort of say, well, how do I do it? A, I read your book. And B, after doing that, you put forth, go out and look at who's well ahead of you on the digital transformation uh, try and benchmark against others, um, look at business cases, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that you talk about and a term you use is exothermal. And I, and I thought that was such an interesting way of putting it. So talk for a moment about the exothermal trans digital transformation of companies. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No. And, um, and, and you're, I'm glad you, you're right on the 20 hours. So maybe you can use the, the first four hours reading the book. And then I wish it was only four hours. Uh, you read <laughs> faster than I do. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, there's a few things in there, right? Maybe first of all, I'll talk about the learning part and then I'll talk about the exothermic. So, um, one of the fun findings, fun, one of the positive findings when we did our research is, um, it's actually not about going out and sort of hiring all the Silicon Valley cool kids, right? So yes, you will need some external talent, right? But the companies that went out and got the digital natives, right? Whether it was Silicon Valley or London or Berlin or whatever, that turns out to be a really good way to change the company dress code, but not a great way to actually drive sustained business impact, right? It's just hard to make that stick unless you also really invest in reskilling and upskilling the leadership team, right? But actually both the leadership team and the front line. So that's the 20 hours, right? Or maybe 20 hours for senior leaders can be more in other parts of the company. But how people really learn about the power of what digital and AI can do. And what we find is a couple of things. First of all, it's hugely more valuable to actually start with the business context and then learn technology than the other way around, right? There's a great quote from a a steel company that we work with where the CEO likes to say, it's easier to teach a metallurgist how to be a data scientist than to teach a data scientist how to be a metallurgist, right? So it's about taking people who know something in your company context and upskilling them. How they learn then can totally depend on the individual and their role and so on. We actually find going to see what other companies are doing and like going on to what we call a go and see is a really helpful way to do that. And not just the tech companies, because you know, if you go and see what um, you know, Microsoft or Google or Amazon are doing, you'll be blown away by that. But it can be quite hard to apply that to like what an average company can do. So instead, go to someone who's like a traditional company who maybe is a few years ahead of you on the digital journey, maybe in a different industry, 
that tends to be a really good way to learn. That gets a bit to the exothermic idea, right? So, you know, this is a little bit around our nerdy science backgrounds, but like the idea is like for the reactions that like keep going, it's got to generate heat, not absorb heat. So what does that mean? First of all, we need to do things that are actually exciting and fun for the people who are participating in it, like going to see what other companies are doing and so on. But also then in terms of where you start, right? If you're trying to say, look, we're going to work really hard and invest for two years and so on, and then amazing things will come out at the end. Very few companies have the patience to sustain that. Instead, it's about breaking it up into three-month or six-month chunks and saying, what's the amazing success that we're going to see at the end of that period that we can see in the P&L that's going to give us the energy to get more people excited and then go to the next thing and go to the next thing? So it's so interesting to hear you talk about the recruiting strategy. Um, and in the book, you talk about both how McKinsey has changed its recruiting strategy and how you all believe that AI is going to help your um, associates, uh, consultants inside of McKinsey on real creativity, technical skills, and then overall leadership. I, I think that the concept that AI is going to help leadership is like fascinating to me. It's a that you wouldn't think that AI is going to be a big enabler of leadership. And then at the same time, anyone who wants to be in a leadership role, as you said, 10 years from now, you're not going to look at a CEO and say, is he or she good on le on, on technology? It's all going to be integrated. And those people who understand the technological revolution that we're going through right now are going to be the leaders. Um, but you also, when you looked at the banking sector, Rodney, those companies that have really been able to digitally transform in the in the in the banking sector were really good at the soft skills. They were yeah. good at recruiting talent, finding career paths, making those teams agile. Talk for a moment about how important those soft skills are. Cause I think, you know, if someone rewound the tape on the last 40 minutes that we're talking, they'd sit there and say, oh, this is all about X's and O's. It's all about big databases. It's all about investment in technology. And what you really point out in the book is, unless you get the people side of it and the soft side of it really nailed, all the rest doesn't really matter. Yeah. So I just, maybe I'll, I'll tell the banking story that you're referring to. It's a little bit of what gave us the title for the book. And, you know, banking is an industry that was among the first to really digitize, right? And it's further along than, than most. And um, I was invited to a uh, consumer banking roundtable that a few of my colleagues were holding. And we have the, the CEOs of a number of the big banks with consumer uh, divisions uh, who were there. And I was like, you know, a couple of minutes into sort of talking about how AI was going to change the world and the bold AI future and so on. And one of them interrupts me and says, you know what? You know, this sounds great, but, you know, my consumer app, is the same as his consumer app. My private wealth app is the same as her private wealth app. We all now have thousands of people doing digital that we didn't use that. Like, what's going on here, right? Is this like some trick invented by the consultants that's just like added cost for all of us and we're all having to like run faster to stay in the same place? So as you can imagine, this became like a, you know, a pretty lively back and forth in this round table. We are like, yeah, yeah, we're just adding cost. Now, what, what's going on? All we said was, you know, hold on, right? Let us actually look at the data, right? Let us go benchmark what you're really doing in digital and then who is and who isn't making money on it. And we looked at about 50 banks. I think there were about a dozen in the room, but we got data from so 50 more through a, a benchmarking service that we had. And what we saw was at a superficial level, what he was saying was right, right? If you looked at the actual apps, they were the same, right? You could not meaningfully tell the difference. Maybe somebody had a feature a few months ahead of someone else or the design was different, but they're all doing the same stuff. But if you looked and said, were they making money? You could see that about the same ratio held, about 25% of them were really making money. And what you saw, you could see that in terms of the growth of digital channels, the value per customer, um, how they were actually increasing labor productivity in the branches and in physical channels. And also that you could trace it all the way back to, to return on equity. So about a quarter of them were making money. So then if you look at the ones who are making money and you say, okay, if their apps are the same, what are they doing that's different? And what we saw in our benchmarking and our survey work was exactly as you just said, Willie, it's the soft stuff, right? And what we saw actually, there were three questions in our survey that were most predictive of who was making money on that, on that transformation journey. First of all was how well the business and technology work together, right? And the ones that really were working well together and really working in agile, that made a huge difference. The second one was, do you have, you know, how good is your like tech talent career ladder? And the companies that had created real career ladders for tech talent, where the tech people did not feel that they were sort of glorified IT help desk, but actually they were sort of co-equal with the business people. That was a huge driver of success. 
And then the third one was funding mechanism, right? And if you were following like a typical annual funding plan, that was like not great. And if instead you were taking a sort of a more VC, maybe three-year funding with regular stage gates approach, that ended up being the path to success. So in, you know, and maybe banking is further along than others because they were all pretty similar on the technical components. But the importance of those sort of softer components and the extent to which it's not about like, do you have a digital veneer, but actually have you like rewired under the hood is what ultimately actually gave us the title for the book. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And it's so insightful as it relates to what, I mean, again, anyone can build an app. Anyone can build an app. And what you're basically saying is peer through to what the app actually does and how it's integrated into your core business and and also the focusing on the front end. I mean, that was one of the other things that I totally took out of your business out of your book, Rodney, was just that those people who focus on the HR function or the finance function as much as those are important are missing the real capability here of interfacing with the client. It's really all front end. And obviously AI and these tools are being used in customer service with chatbots um, and and quick response times to the frequently asked questions and all that great stuff. Um, but it really is taking the risk of rethinking your business in a digital world. I mean, if you sat around the table yesterday with my executive team and sort of said, okay, how is someone going to borrow from Walker and Dunlop five years from now or 10 years from now? It, it takes a lot of dreaming. One of the quotes I, I mentioned at the beginning, your Gloria Steinem quote that you put in the in the book, but as as she says, dreaming is part of planning. Yeah. And then unless you're willing to sit around at the table and throw some stuff against the wall that just sort of says, well, they're going to borrow seamlessly with one click on their iPhone. I mean, given the amount of time and effort that goes into making a $25 million mortgage on a on an apartment building, um, that that's that's dreaming. That's truly dreaming. Yeah. But you know, it's gonna be at a theater near you probably sooner than we would expect. Um, and so I just I thought it was so helpful that you really in the book, as much as there's so much technical data in there, you also underscore the need for the human resource, human allocation career pathing and and that point about tech resources i think to anyone who's listening in on this to understand the importance of those tech resources and tech professionals to your company um i know the names of every senior banker at walker and dunlop i engage with him or her consistently to go out and meet with clients i don't to my own criticism know the names of our top top tech uh, talent inside of Walker Nell. I know some, but not as many as I need to. And to me, in reading your book, I sort of said, uh-uh, you got to rewire the way you're thinking about talent inside of w and If we're going to make this transformation, I need to spend be spending not only time with them, but rewarding them and having them grow in a career path that is commensurate with where our bankers and brokers are. That's exactly right. right? And what we've seen is the companies who do that, right, who really invest in a tech talent career path, right? can attract and retain amazing tech talent no matter what their industry or their location is, right? I mean, there's a company we talk about in the book, um, uh, Freeport, Freeport McMoran. Oh, yeah. That's a good story. Yeah. So in in in, in Baghdad, Arizona, right, which, you know, it, it you know, it's probably only a two-hour flight from Silicon Valley, but it's probably spiritually pretty far from Silicon Valley, right? They built an amazing tech and data team, right, in Baghdad, Arizona and at their other mining sites really through doing exciting things, through getting people excited about the mission and the impact that they can have, and being very thoughtful about creating this tech talent ladder that lets them bring in tech people who really have growth opportunities, leadership visibility, and real sort of equality with the top business leaders in the company. But double click on that for a second, Rodney, because I think it's so important. The That's a mining company. Yep. It was faced with a reinvestment of $200 million in the mine. And, and most people would sit there and say, what, what like technology, like, well, hold on a second. You either like write the check to go in and dig a little bit deeper, or you kind of, you pull out and close up the mine and go home. Talk for a moment about how they transform those 40 decision points to, to basically not only change the yield of that plant, but change the way that the entire mining industry looks at plant utilization. Yeah, so it's a it's a great story, right? So, and by the way, when I'm mentioning a company name, that's because they've talked about it publicly. Like normally, yeah. we wouldn't talk about our clients. So, I'll tell the story as they tell it. So, you know, they if you take that Baghdad mine, right? Their their business is 
um, relatively simple. You take all out of the ground at about 1%. You put it through a copper concentrator. It comes out at the other end at about 20%. I, I live in New York City. There's only so much I know about mining, but I think I'm roughly right. right? Because they've been mining in Baghdad for nearly 100 years, the quality of that ore seam has gone sort of down and down. And it's down to about, I think, about a half a percent. So they were looking at that and saying, okay, so to get the same output, we need to go build another copper concentrator, right? That's a $200 million CapEx piece of equipment. I think we have a picture of it in the in the book. I mean, it's like, it's an enormous thing. And they were looking at doing that. And at the time they were looking at doing that, this was pre-COVID, like the, the global copper markets were wobbling a little bit. And they were thinking like, is there really going to be enough ROI in a $200 million CapEx investment? So instead, the head of the site and his technology lead said, give us a year, right? Let us actually figure out if there's another way to get there instead of just going putting this massive, you know, CapEx investment. Going. And what they did was they got the mining engineers at the side and they got some, you know, some external help, but really a pretty focused amount. And they really said, let's actually try and build a mathematical model, right? a digital twin of that copper concentrator. And let's look at the 42 different decisions that go into how a copper concentrator works. And let's see if we've optimized them. Right? Let's model it out. And it was everything from the temperature, the throughput, to how many trucks wait in line, to how big the safety stock should be, and so on. And sure enough, when they modeled it out into a series of, I think they were doing six-week or eight-week sprints where they would try a model, test it in real life, keep trying and testing, and so on. What they saw is the way they were running it, which was based on you know dozens of years of experience of senior operators, wasn't actually the best way to run it, right? So for example, the safety stocks, they had a rule of thumb that said the safety stock couldn't be lower than a certain level or it would risk you know the, the plant running out. Turns out that level was way too high and you could run the safety stock much lower. On the number of trucks waiting in line, right? They didn't want more than one or two trucks waiting in line. They thought it was wasteful. The optimal number turned out to be three or four. Temperature, throughput, right? All these decisions that like no one decision any human could have spotted. But when you look at the system together, there's a different mathematical way to optimize it that for them got to uh, out the gate an 11% output improvement or yield improvement. By the way, a better safety record as well, because they had, I think, less changes and handoffs during the process. Over time, that 11%, I think, grew to 15%. And that was m enough, actually way more than enough to offset the need to go and build giant CapEx. But they did this in enough places over time that the company eventually publicly said, we're actually going to tilt our strategy away from you know giant holes in the ground and new capex and towards trying to get more value out of these existing assets and with massive success the rest of the industry saw that and then you know tried to follow but with the 18 month lead that they had they've been very successful at continuing to sort of move down that learning curve and stay ahead and really use you know digital twin basically an ai optimizer to really just help transform the delivery of the delivery of copper right in this environment that's as far from silicon valley as you can imagine so you talk about the impact that that had on Freeport. Talk for a moment about the database that McKinsey has built that allows all of the consultants worldwide to go in and do a query into your own database. And, and I think one of the most interesting things about how you all are using it is not that it's a great resource library, if you will, that says that Rodney Zemmel used to talk about mid-stage leadership for CEOs and and not the beginning and the end of a of, of a tenure, which you can go and find pretty quickly. And I appreciate that you're smiling that I went and did that research on you. Uh, but that it also defines who inside the enterprise is the sort of current expert. Like I'll just give you one quick example, Rodney, that we we just were dealing with. We we were going after a piece of business. We were bidding against eight competitor firms. I was pulled into the pitch call. We did the pitch call and I was the only CEO of the eight firms that showed up on the call. So that helped differentiate a little bit. And then after the call, I put an email out to my executive team saying, Hey, we just had this call and this company is selling a property and we were on this, this, that. And then back from that, came a note from one of my senior executives saying, oh, well, you know, this person inside of Walker and Dunlop knows this person inside of that big, big, large client yeah. really, really well. And you ought to connect this team pitching to go in and make sure that they know that we have great connectivity. And what came out of that was that if you'd gone into Salesforce at Walker and Dunlop and you'd look, that Salesforce wouldn't tell you that. 
Salesforce wouldn't say this person knows that person really, really well. You could set up something that says who has the strongest relationship and it would come back, you know, relationship lead or whatever else. But that type of anecdotal feedback from a senior executive only came from that senior executive knowing the relationships. And so we sat around yesterday and talked about how do you create a database that allows for that connecting the dots that doesn't require a human to do it, an executive who gets an email from me, which would be the only way the team would get that kind of feedback, but actually instill it into the database. And I was interested that you all have created this feature that says, if you want to know the answer to this question, call Rodney. Yeah, no, that's right. So what you're talking about is that we have this thing we built called a Lily inside McKinsey. And our working original working name for it was Jarvis, but it turned out Marvel owned the, uh, owned the copyright to that. So we couldn't use it. So uh, so we, we called it Lily. And what it is, is it's basically, it's it's generative AI for concision. And concision is concise plus precision. And it lets you ask, you can already say, you know, like, what's the, you know, I don't know, what's the global market for apples or something, right? And you can get the answer in milliseconds on your phone. Um, but that's not that useful, right? It only becomes useful when you can combine that with your own company's proprietary data in a way that has the right one-way valves on it so it doesn't leak to the outside world, but also in a way that understands context, right? It knows the difference between what's something from a real thought leader inside your organization as part of a thoughtful discussion or presentation versus what's something it's pulling from some random email. So that's what we set out to build. And we we, we actually, it searches across 42 different internal databases in McKinsey. Um, about 150,000 hours of sanitized external interviews, a sanitized staffing log, so who's worked on what topic and so on, won't necessarily know what, what, what client. So you can ask a question like, I don't know, how do you do a, um, uh, a diagnostic of retail store operations, right? And you know, something that many of our teams might be working on on any one day. And you put that question in and out will come, you know, here's the recommended approach, right? My best internal knowledge documents. Here's four or five names of internal experts who know this topic well based on the work they've done. By the way, click here and sort of slide across for here's what the external world has published on this topic. So you can see what Harvard Business Review says about it or you know what a Google search would say or something. But then you know, hopefully people would draw on the McKinsey knowledge. And then we're tracking to see if people actually call the experts, right? Because the written text version is never going to give you the whole story. So we want teams to use this as an accelerator, but not such an accelerator that it's a shortcut. And then they don't bother actually going and checking with the real expert when they need to. And it's working, you know, incredibly um, uh, uh, well for us. And, you know, you know, for, for, all, the, for all the talk of, uh, you know, are we going to see white collar labor, um, you know, decimated and, you know, massive uh, replacement of people by machines and so on. I mean, the very first effect is going to be the most boring and tedious parts of people's jobs going away and being automated. And what we're finding is teams are loving this and using it to really accelerate their work and get further and help clients better, sort of further faster, rather than having to go through some of, you know, the more mundane, you know, search and phone a friend and so on. It's making a huge difference. I think it's so fascinating that you think about Freeport, a mining company and how they implemented it. You think about a consulting firm like McKinsey and how you all have implemented it. I just think- Actually, I'll give you another, another. so a few companies have heard us like doing this. So we're, we're building versions of this in a few other places. And there's a, um, a Taiwanese electronics manufacturer that I, that, I, that I work with. And that, you know, they have some amazing sort of product leaders and electrical engineers and some they think of they're a little bit more average. So they wanted us to build one of these for them to help upscale their electrical engineers, right? So how to make the average electrical engineer as good as their most expert electrical engineer. And it's super exciting, right? It's really cool to see how it, it's helped them in a short period of time. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, w one thing is we try and wrap this up as, you know, the, the book has so much on A, getting the roadmap established, getting senior leadership, hiring the right people, having a hiring strategy with, these pods that go in, make sure that you're only picking two to five projects out of the bag and, and, and make sure that they're going to have a significant impact on your business. And then after all of that, that helps you kind of set the stage, you come back to, but don't forget that establishing really good OKRs is fundamental. Creating sprints is fundamental and doing QBRs is fundamental. Talk for a moment about it. We think about this whole new realm and yet at the same time, you all bring it back. And one other quick thing before you answer that question, Riley, which I thought was fascinating. In the book, after every chapter, you 
you set up a series of questions that allow the reader to reflect back on what he or she read in the chapter to make sure that you're kind of grasping the overall impact of what you're trying to do with that chapter. And I don't know whether McKinsey does that in your presentations to clients, but I found it to be an incredibly helpful tool as, I mean, they all say, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them again, and then tell them again at the very end. But the way that you created those questions at the end of chat, every chapter to reflect back on what you just learned was an incredibly helpful way to sort of, if you will, sort what it was, but specifically to OKR sprints and QBRs. Yeah, no, but I'm, and I'm glad you, you you like that and how we set it up. So there's a certain there there's a certain methodology that goes that goes with digital that um you know some people get a bit put off by it's like okay it's all about scrums and agile and da 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 like this is just like some you know weird fancy religion and so on you know it works right it doesn't actually matter what you call it right and but what we saw is if you look at the 25 to 30 percent of companies who are making money in digital. They were all doing some version of Agile, right? Many of them didn't call it Agile. They call it something else. They wouldn't call it anything. But pretty much everybody who was in that money-making quadrant was doing this. And the this has a few characteristics, right? First of all, it is business and technology working together, right? If you've ever got a business team that is writing requirements and then turfing those over to technology to go and execute, that's a failure mode, right? That's the old... IT world, that's not digital world, right? You need business and technology co-owning a problem and working together on it rather than shipping requirements back and forth. Next, you actually need the control functions also in those agile parts, right? If you've got business and technology, but you don't also have finance, quality, HR, legal, you know, whatever it is that's relevant in your industry, then you really, then all you're doing is moving the bottlenecks further down, further down the, down the road. Then in terms of how you manage those teams, the sprint cycle, right? Whether it's six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, doesn't matter. But something that is short enough to get to a clear deliverable that people can see. And then, inst- and then you would actually involve, you know, senior leadership, often the CEO in those sprint reviews to see what comes out on those sprints to keep things moving on the right cycle and to make sure people are talking about the real product and not some sort of PowerPoint distillation of what the product is. And then OKRs, right? So, you know, back, right near the beginning of the conversation, we're talking about, can you actually measure the business impact of digital and how do you do that? It can be quite hard at an individual application level to say, okay, how much money we're we really going to make through feature X versus feature Y and so on. So our general advice is don't try and do that, right? Set the financial goal at the top. And then for every piece, for every individual use case that might be underneath that financial goal, you manage that through OKR of objectives and key results. So just very, very focused. What are the objectives that you're trying to achieve with that particular use case or that particular piece of the project? And manage to that. And I have confidence if you keep managing to that, it will then ladder up to the overall financial objective, right? But don't just try and measure everything through a typical financial planning approach. So I want to end with um, two quotes and then have you sort of leave us with your thought as it relates to something that we may not have either discussed or what people ought to keep their mind on. Um, This is backing up to, you talked in the book a lot about security and security of data and people who want to have their own databases controlled and putting things into a large language model and what the security risks are there. But you put a quote in the book, Rodney, that I think is just great, which is just talking about basic passwords to log into your computer this morning. And I'd never heard this before and I wanted to make sure I got it in here, which is treat your password like a toothbrush. Don't let anyone else use it and get a new one every six months. And you quote Clifford Stoll in that, which I thought was just such, I just was in there like, that makes so much sense. And we all talk about password security and changing it all the time. I was like, yeah, don't let anyone else use it and change it every six months. I thought that was just great, even though the security you're talking about is on such a different level. But to those of us who log into a computer every day, I thought that was a great reminder. Yes. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think like changing my toothbrush, I don't quite do it that often, but we should. <laughs> and, and, and then the other one that I thought was so great was you you have a great quote from the Princess Bride of Miracle Max, which to anyone who, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Princess Bride, one of the great movies ever, but he he talks about rushing the miracle. And if you rush a miracle, you get a rut, you get a, I can't remember exactly what it was. A miracle, I, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And I, I think that's super helpful as people think about diving into this, that there's so much talk about it. When I listen to all of your interviews, you're like, you know, I, I've never been asked to talk more in my entire career. In the last six months, I've had everyone on the face of the planet ask me to come talk about generative AI. 
There's a little bit of hype there today, but this digital transformation is real. It's been going on for 30 years and it's going to continue to go forward. And anyone who doesn't get on this train is really going to miss it. But there's this sense of everybody of sort of like, I got to get to it. I got to get to it. And I thought that miracle Max quote was so good in the sense that there are no miracles here. There is no technological solution that you can just snap your fingers and implement. And that really, if you think about it, while we all talk about digital transformation technology, as you so effectively underscore in the book, it's really more of a management slash corporate transformation and journey than it is, hey, we got to get there and tomorrow we're going to have some whiz bang technology. Yeah. And actually that's a perfect thought to leave people with, right? So because because this is, you know, this is just going to be the way sophisticated modern companies do business, right? And it's interesting. We have a survey that we operate on, like we call it digital quotient on how digitized different companies are. And if you looked at the data sort of three or four years ago, everything was pretty much arrayed by industry, right? So if you were in banking or in high tech, you were super digitized. And if you were in industrials or public sector, right, you were super non-digitized, real estate generally more toward the non-digitized end. And so industry was really destiny. What we've seen in the last maybe 18 months in particular is companies have really broken out of their industry averages. And there's now more difference within an industry than there is between industries, right? So the best retailer is more digital than the average high-tech company. And the lagging retailers are less digital than, you know, the worst public sector institution, right? It's really sort of spread out. And once companies get ahead, they then stay ahead and move further. We see that spread increasing over time. So, you know, maybe ending with your sort of your Miracle Max quote. And by the way, you know, Boss Sites, our editor, helped us find all these quotes. I'll, I'll pass your, your appreciation on to him. Um, it, it, it is that this is not, you know, transformation is the wrong word. This is a journey. Um, if you've not already started on the journey, now is really the time to move on it because these new tools, you know, generative AI and so on, massively actually lower the cost and accelerate the speed of moving. That's a challenge as well as a blessing because that can lead to death by a thousand pilots and you know, proliferation and so on. So that's why you really have to start where chapter one is in the book with this top-down business like digital road. I am deeply thankful for you spending an hour talking about it. It's been fascinating. I'm, it's a great book. As I hope everyone who listened in today can tell, go buy it. And uh, Rodney, thank you so much for your time. Thank you and great to see you. Take care.